something grabs me and, and, and I explore it and I think about it and I, you know, do a little, do some work on it. And then, and, and sometimes they, things don't work out, but sometimes they do and, and they just, a project just won't let me go. Uh, Mother Jones was a good example. She worked as, a, as an organizer for the United Mine Workers, the Western Federation of Miners. She was a one of the founding members, one of those few founding members of the IWW here in Chicago. She's doing all this when she's 70, 80, 90 years old. She actually, was, she actually started exaggerating her age around 1900. She was actually seven years younger than she claimed to be. Um, in the book I wrote about her, the best line in the book is that uh, uh, is Mother Jones was 93 years old on the day she celebrated her 100th birthday. Her speeches were just profane and electric, and to read the accounts of them, you just have the sense of how miners and other working class people, she organized all kinds of trades, how they responded to her. Uh, she was their mother, um, and, and not just the men, she also organized a lot of the women, women in particular, women who were workers, but also women who were wives of, of men who were workers. This idea of a family of labor is what really animates what she does. She's this remarkable figure who's been largely forgotten now that the labor movement is in somewhat in decline. But in her day, she was just amazingly famous uh, and important. I started working on, again, another project that just sort of wouldn't let me go. I became very interested in that year in 1933 and 34 when John Dillinger was robbing banks all across the Midwest. I guess the subtitle is um, The Year That Made America's Public Enemy Number One, and it really is about that year, about the Great Depression, that context for understanding Dillinger. And, and I think what's interesting is that Americans understood him and his robbing banks in terms of the Great Depression. People said things like, he's just being honest, he robs a bank with a gun rather than with a fountain pen. It's still, again, an iconic story here in Chicago. Uh, there's still a little, a little moment Every July 22nd, uh, uh, on, down on, on um, Lincoln Avenue at the Biograph Theater, where he was gunned down by FBI agents at 10.20 at night. There's always a gathering. The project I'm working on now, I seem to keep going forward in time, is about uh, a terrible, terrible incident, a terrible murder that took place in 1955. Um, uh, and it's a story that's well known, and yet much about it isn't known. It's the Emmett Till murder. A uh, 14-year-old kid from Chicago, African-American South Sider, uh, goes down to visit family in the tiny town of Money, Mississippi. There are disputes as to what exactly happened. He goes into a tiny grocery in the tiny, tiny Delta town of Money, Mississippi, probably goaded by his friends, and um, does he whistle at this white woman working there or say some words that would otherwise be considered fresh? It's an enormous story in black America. It's the headline story for months in the African-American press. The thing about this story, though, that's so galvanizing is that moment, in some ways you can see it in not one but two photographs. As it's a photo that circulates of Till with his mother, Mamie, a woman who lives on the south side, works as a civilian for the United States Air Force, an office job, you know, respectable uh, 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 family. And then when the body is finally taken out of the river, they're about to bury it in Mississippi. She says, no, I want the casket sent back to, uh, to Chicago, and they do. And the body, of course, is in terrible shape. And again, she says, no, I want the world to see what they did to my boy. And there's an open uh, uh, coffin funeral uh, 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 down on the south side. Tens of thousands of people show up. It's an enormous event. And it's that photograph of Till that's first published uh, by Jet Magazine and then in the Defender and, in, and elsewhere in the black press that's just this galvanizing moment. In retrospect, many, many people who were involved in the civil rights movement and the freedom struggle have talked about it as an important moment in their lives. It's usually told as a Mississippi story, which of course it is, but it's also a Chicago story. And I think I... Uh, I think I want to tell it more as a story about the South Side, as about, about African-American uh, organizing and so on.